Now the number one deer hunting access really relates to you getting on and off the land without spooking deer. That should be the case. That should be uh, your first and foremost uh, goal is, you know, when you're on the land, you hunt, you leave, do you have impact? Are you a predator? And what I find is most people are not. And when it brings up when we're getting these uh, big November hunting days and gun season days approaching, um, there are a lot of lands that are spoiled for a week hunt, for a several day hunt on a small parcel. And they're ruined a lot of times in the first hour of the hunt because hunters are access accessing the land poorly, the deer are educated and they leave. And I'll bring up something real quick before we even dive into these points. I wanna bring up something, this is a separate video topic, but how many days can you hunt your land without affecting the land negatively. I have a friend, a previous client, he's up north in Wisconsin, he's there for a week, eight days, nine days to hunt. His, his property is literally a two day property, meaning he doesn't have a lot of cover. Um, he has a camper there. When he goes in and hunts, very, very invasive, even if none of his neighbors around him are applying any hunting pressure. And, and really, in my experience, in a property like that, after you've been there a couple days, um, unless you have that wandering mature buck that's coming through, which it's warm temperatures. They're coming from a mile, two, two miles away. It's too warm. They're not going to make it. They're not going to make it to the land. And so that land's ruined in a couple days. We had 21 stands, 195 acres in Wisconsin. We hunted that property for 12 years, shot a lot of bucks. Just between my, my buddy Carl and I, we shot 26 bucks in 12 years, something like that. And we thought that in a three day long weekend hunt with all those stands and just the two of us bow hunting, we had about a good three days that we could hunt that, four days at the most, and we need to get out of there and let it sit for a week or two. Now, most properties can heal. Let's say you apply pressure, the negativity starts to become um, apparent to the deer and, and your hunting uh, success. Well, it only takes a week or two for that, uh, that property to heal. The longer you extend past that, for example, my client up in northern Wisconsin, where he's hunting the third day, fifth day, seventh day, eighth day, the longer it's going to take for that property to heal. So a normal property would have taken a week to heal that you could actually go back and hunt and be uh, non-invasive because of your access and your access all around the land that would heal in a week. It's going to take three or four weeks to heal. And folks, we just don't have that long uh, to hunt. Most 40 acre parcels, average setting out there, you can apply pressure for two or three days. The exception is that rut cruising funnel stand where you're hunting deer that might come from a mile or two away and you're just going into the same funnel stand. You can do this on public land too and you hit that stand over and over again because the buck that you could potentially spook might not be the buck that would come through three days from now from four miles away that's getting pushed by other hunters or cruising. And the larger the amount of timber, the further they're gonna cruise, the more compact and higher the age structure, the less they're going to cruise. They don't wanna interact with each other as much. So just some tips on how long can your land, your land even ask or last? And partly number one here, the reason that these parcels don't last very long, your parcel doesn't last very long, is you allow the deer to pattern you a lot more than you can pattern them. So sight, sound, scent, how much are you leaving behind? Can deer see you? And most importantly, can they hear you? So your best deer hunting access allows you to get on and off the land without the deer seeing, hearing, or smelling you. That should be rather obvious but think about it. I, I always bring up the point, uh, you know, we have a video out there if deer had guns. And if deer had guns, how would you change your hunting tactics? And if you would change your hunting tactics because they had guns, you should do it knowing they don't have guns and you just want to be a smart hunter and actually find consistent success. And the older the mature bucks become, the more you're going to have to work hard to make sure that they don't see you, hear you, or smell you every time you're on and off the land. So that's point number one. Number two, you can afford to be a little loud. If your access takes advantage of existing daily human movement. Now, that could be in the ag field where there's a lot of tractors. We have some ag field around here in, the, in uh, Minnesota where our local farming neighbors do an incredible job of placing manure on the land, plowing under, picking, chopping corn, cutting their hay. And they're always out there. They're always fertilizing. They're always working on the fields. It seems like we've been here since June and there's not a week that goes by. They're not out there with their tractors. That gives you a little ability if you want to get in and out with a tractor. But I can tell you down in my hollow down here, where you go down four or 500 yards in the woods, if you bring a tractor down there, you're going to spook every deer off the land because the deer are not used to a tractor. 
being down in the middle of that. So really think about that's not consistent daily movement of humans down in the hollow. It is out in the open ag fields. So one thing to access the land at three in the afternoon, it's getting dark and six with a diesel and you're getting into the, the actual tree stand and then the diesel's leaving as opposed to going in there at four in the morning even with a diesel because the diesels aren't in the field. The tractors aren't on the field at four in the morning. Now I think of the areas of UP of Michigan where I used to um, hunt and live for a long time up uh, near Munising in that area. And some of those ATV trails that people use, and they're even using them more now. It seemed like, almost seems like people have migrated from snowmobiles to ATV. It's more of a family thing. They're doing it all summer long, maybe a little bit more affordable too. But uh, to some extent, some of those high use ATV trails, if you're going back in on public land, an ATV might not necessarily be a bad thing because deer, you're parking your ATV and you have a team of ATVs, seven of them going by you. And so deer are somewhat used to that. Now what I find is mature bucks don't consistently live along an ATV trail like they might along a highway or something, but great access, especially if you're going in another quarter mile, walking in half mile and getting to a remote area. And those deer are used to that consistent daily human activity or deer pattern. Another scenario with that is then you look at the opposite where there's just not a lot of people at all. And you get into some of the fantasy land states and, uh, where you're hunting Iowa, Kansas, some of those big buck areas where there's not a lot of hunting pressure, large parcels. We have a parcel around here um, that a lot of big bucks were just shot on a couple weeks ago, but it's close to 2,700 acres. And so a lot of people think there's eight guys hunting on this and they go shoot some big bucks, but they can get away with a little bit of ATV traffic side by side, using some noise, making some noise, getting to their stands because the size of the property encompasses the mistakes. There's a lot of deer on 2,700 acres. So that's an exception, large parcels, fantasy land states where you can get away with a lot more noise. One of the things I sh maybe should have left this to the end, but number three, when you leave your land after hunting two, th two days a week, three days. One of the things we took a lot of pride in when we were hunting is when my buddy Carl and I would leave the property where we had hunted three days or Tim, um, Max was around a lot. But when we would leave those Ross, we would look at when we left that land and we're driving home. And, and it, this even boiled down to a sit. You know, when you come in, one of it was how many deer did you see? But the next question was how many deer did you spook? And so when we left for after a three day hunt or a four day, we had a lot of discussion. How do we feel like the land was intruded on while we were there? Did we see that decline in use? Did we see it with our trail cameras? Um, do we feel like we had to leave it in a couple of weeks instead of a week, instead of coming back down, driving seven hours? Uh, do we feel that three or four days was too much? My buddy Carl would come down for a nine, he would come up for a nine day hunt out of Georgia. So he was driving all the way as a Michigan resident or used to be a Michigan resident, got to know him there in the nineties. He would come up and hunt for nine days and there were literally one or two days during that nine days he would not hunt. There were several morning or evenings that he wouldn't hunt in there. So out of a nine day hunt, he might have five days of total hunting, you know, 10 total sits if you broke them in morning and evening because we had to manage our pressure on the land and we wanted to leave the land thinking that, boy, we can't wait to come back because the deer are set up. Meaning that we didn't spook them, they didn't see us, hear us, smell us, to a very large degree. So that gave us the ability to come back fairly soon and have a great hunt. So it's really important discussion time. How are you leaving the land? And it's really cool with the cell cameras now. I was talking to Dylan this morning and he was pretty invasive in these high winds we had a, a couple weeks ago, putting in a new stand set up or a week ago. And uh, he was pleasantly surprised when he checked the cell cameras and, and he had big bucks coming into this setup right away and he didn't feel like he disturbed anything and I can guarantee if they go back out and sit it's going to be an awesome time to hunt because the cell cams revealed that your trail cameras can tell you that new rub scrapes always think about how are you leaving the land are you leaving it in peace number four this is a big one opening day of Minnesota gun season tomorrow and we're going to be heading out our little orange army I'm sitting with my buddy Mike Dante's going to be here with his friend Alec they're sitting together and then uh, Diane wants to be by herself. <laughs> she doesn't want me filming. She, uh, I asked, well, you want Gunner to come film you? No. What if Dylan's available? No. <laughs> she, wants to, she wants to go sit by herself, and I think that's pretty cool. She just picked up a new gun. She had to get a new gun for shotgun season over here. She couldn't use a muzzleloader or something, so she's really excited about her new gun and uh, being able to hunt out there. But when we go out in the woods, 
imagine we're trying to get in, get into position. Uh, it's supposed to be really windy tomorrow. It's really windy right now. I think we're, our noise is going to be covered. They're not going to see us because we're going in the dark. Uh, they're not going to smell us because we're using the right access relating to sight, sound, and scent. They're not going to. But one of the things that we could really blow is we go across these open fields with a big headlamp on or flashlight. Maybe we wouldn't have our quiet cats that we have right here and we turn the light on, the headlight on the, the quiet cat and get out there. Well, we're, we're really effectively ruining our hunt before it starts because we have, might have that mature buck that's back in the woods 70 yards. He's just cruising on a funnel on an inside bench or something or inside cor corner uh, uh, funnel in between two big wood lots. And we spook him from a quarter mile away because he sees that flashlight coming. Again, he's patterning us more than we can pattern him because of that flashlight. And that extends to headlamps, bright flashlights, headlights on bikes, headlights on side-by-sides, even an electric golf cart. You might have done everything else right, but you're turning that light on and letting him know again, hey, if you hunt in a fantasy land state, if you hunt on 3,000 acres, 2,000 acres, 1,500 acres, 1,000 acres, Maybe you don't have to worry about it because the deer you spook are not used to people anyways, but at the same time, the size of the land or the lack of hunting pressure of the state can encompass your mistakes and allow you to get away with what you know the average hunter cannot do. And number five, ATV doom. So many lands, so many hunts, gun season coming up are ruined at the turn of a key at the cabin. It was interesting, I put UP public land invasion. And imagine the ATV trails, they have their normal ATV use all year, people bird hunting, going up and down. They're just, it seems like people, especially with the side-by-sides now, the people are really enjoying those as a family. So they get used to those areas. But imagine all those areas, cabins that are lightly used the entire year, they're only used during gun season, uh, dead-end roads where people are bringing bait to, um, and, they're, and they're going out on the land. You guys going out, before light, taking the ATV. I mean, how often, ask yourself, again, is it consistent daily human activity that is common in the area? If it's common for ATVs to go out on your land at four in the morning, you're probably not gonna have a lot of mature bucks on it anyways. But think about it, if you're going out at four in the morning for the first time with the ATV, probably not a smart idea. I know in the public land, I'm not kidding, I'd be back two miles, walking in 45 minutes, at least three quarters of a mile to a mile from any bait pile anywhere, back in some swamps and some funnels. And I literally would have deer run into me at daybreak because it sounded like an invasion of ATVs in every direction. It's how everyone hunted. It's pretty crazy too. It's kind of like, I'd buy a souped up golf cart, buy a, uh, buy a quiet cat for a few thousand dollars, but people have a $10,000 ATV or $20,000 side by side. It's almost like you have to justify to, to use it. So they're taking it on opening day of gun season. And, uh, and it's one of the few times they even use it all year long. And it really is an invasion. It didn't, it helped my hunting, so I'm not complaining. You know, that it's up in the UP, I thought it was awesome. It really, it's a really good tactic for you to get in the middle of, of those areas that are not an ATV. But boy, on your small private parcel, on these really hilly wooded parcels around here, I really hope that all my neighbors are using ATVs because I'll be the one property in the area that's not. And uh, it's not that my, I don't want my neighbors to have success or have fun hunting, but I certainly like taking advantage of hunters that are allowing deer, number one, to pattern them more than they're patterning the deer, patterning the deer. So think about that, your number one hunting deer access. You know, a lot of people think about um, the quietness of their gear, quietness of tree stands, blinds, how you're accessing the land and deer aren't seeing you. There's a lot of people that access the land really well, but deer hear them or see them or smell them when they're getting into that land. They think, well, I'm getting into the spot, I'm going into the wind, I'm going to this hidden corner of the property. But again, if deer can see you, hear you, or smell you, deer patterning you, you're really behind a lot of times before it even gets daybreak. Before you even get to sit in your tree stand, your hunt's ruined. And think about that, are you a predator? Are you getting on the off the land without leaving your scent? Can you actually leave after this weekend's gun hunt, this weekend's rut hunt, whatever it might be, and say, you know what? I don't even think the deer knew that we were on the land hunting. Do your trail cameras show up, show that, do your stands, do your cell cams? And if they do, then you're on track to have the number one deer hunting access 
boy, it varies by every property what you need, whether you're blending into other human activity next to a schoolyard, a factory, a neighborhood, whatever it might be, you can match those sounds. But always try to leave the land with less pressure or the same pressure before you even arrived in the first place, and you'll have find, found the number one deer hunting access for your property, your public land, your private land hunt this fall. Well, if you made it to the end of this video, you're obviously interested in white tail habitat solutions, what I have to teach, and you will love my new web class series. The first one is how to design your white tail property. It's out now. The link is in the description. I invite you to check it out. It's on my website. Can't wait to hear about it.